Welcome to VIP Access. We're back with a brand new season, coming to you live and direct from Nairobi Street Kitchen. Today's interview is going to be legendary. And just to give you a little bit of a tip about who I'm about to interview, I only know two rappers in Africa, Manifest and no one else in particular. Hello, Mani. Hello, that was a good introduction. Thank you. <laughs> You're super cool. When I heard that song, I was just like waiting. Oh, who's gonna who's 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 gonna be this other rapper? And I was like, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I was I was I was just uh, as, how do they say I was winding people up. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Manifest. It's such an honor to meet you. I've been following you for many years, listening to your music, and obviously when we're talking about hip hop in Africa, you're one of those names at the top of the top and also in Ghana. So it's really a pleasure for me to meet you, for you to come down to my country, um, Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome. Karibu. <laughs> Akwaba. <laughs> ah, there we go. This is cultural exchange at its finest. No, I love, I love Kenya, love Nairobi. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm honored to be here and I might even extend, you never know. <laughs> You're not really a stranger to, you know, Nairobi, to Kenyans, and uh, you've collaborated with Camp Mula back when they were Camp Mula, even before, you know, the breakup. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your relationship with Kenya in general. Like, did you keep in touch with them? Are there other artists that you're vibing to? What's the plan? Well, I've always had Kenyan friends, even before the music. You know, when I used to live in the States, uh, there was an interesting, I used to live in Minneapolis, there was an interest in both Somali and Kenyan population in uh, Minnesota and the Twin Cities. So I've always had my connections to Kenya. But uh, yeah, I came to Nairobi years ago, worked with Camp Mula, that was super dope. Met different people in the industry and just in real life, that were also dope. Um, kept in touch loosely with some, and over the years built more relationships. Shout out to Anuri. Uh, shout out to Blinky Bill, shout out to Karun, you know, just many super cool people. So this place is, I think, one of the most, and, you know, low-key, one of the, the, the dopest African cities, which have not, has not really kind of, people are not saying it as much or as loud, but it's, it's low-key. The, I, I, the vibes and the people, there's, there's just dopeness here. You know? oh, wow. yeah. I'm really flattered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nairobi says thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, talking of um, dope cities um, and dope people, dope vibes, I mean, Ghana, Accra is happening. It's always been happening, but there seems to be kind of a rebirth in the past couple of years. You know, in December, that's where it's happening. Everybody wants to be in Ghana. Everybody wants to collaborate with the Ghanaians. As a Ghanaian, you know, how does that feel? And what's the vibe kind of um, on ground? Would you say that this is how the country and the city is running all year round, or do you feel like it's a dirty December thing? <laughs> well, I mean, dirty December is its own thing, obviously. It's like spring break in America or anything. Yeah. Things like that obviously have just an influx of people, but it has been a year-round thing in the sense of the fact that Ghana is still historically a very significant African country for the diaspora. Lots of people trace roots there, you know, mm -hmm. so... So with this increased focus on acquiring Ghana in general, there's, there's been more traffic, which is dope, because it does have a residual effect on other African countries, etc. Because sometimes people come to Ghana and they want to go to other African countries. Yeah. When I was coming here, I saw some African Americans who had gone to Ghana and then they were coming to Nairobi. So you understand? So it's, it's dope because... Um, and also historically, this is something that has happened in the past before. When Kwame Nkrumah was president, you had Maya Angelou who came to live in Ghana. You had uh, W. Dubois. You had oh, Malcolm X came Ghana. there, Martin Luther, etc. So in a way, uh, Ghana is finding itself back in a place that has been before, oh, wow. you know, um, which is cool, you know, because at the end of the day, we're also very warm, welcoming people. And I think it is, uh, it it's kind of becomes a gateway for all of us as Africans, you know. But to be honest, even though I enjoy Ghana, I enjoy other African cities more because sometimes home can get tired. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fantastic. Thank you, Ghanaians, you know, for representing Africa so well, you know, providing a home and a haven for the international community um, and your president and government making and the tourism department making it very easy for people who want to come live there. I wouldn't go that far to be given all these departments. <laughs> no, but let's just say that the, the, the approach has changed. But also, most importantly for me, Forget just foreigners, other Africans. I think African tourism is a thing that needs to be booming in our generation. You know, most of us go to more European and North American and other countries more than we go to African countries. It's time for us to do that. And, and, that, we, and that is attracting all these other people. But even if that, if that weren't the case, other Africans going to other African countries would be the dopeness that I would even care about. We're all just so dope and different but connected that it would be enough for me. Yeah. And I have to also say, like, Ghana is one of the countries changing that even for the African continent. And when I say foreigners, I, I actually mean even other Africans. Because right now, even for Africans, if you ask them what's the top destination, a lot of them will be like, we have to be in Ghana. And I just know in December, every other African who's traveling is going to be in Ghana. So it's a really cool thing. Congratulations on the release of your album, your recent album, Medina to the Universe. Fantastic. So I think when we met, the first question I had um, for you is, what is Medina or where is Medina? Tell me about the vibes um, and the culture and the inspiration and you know, what Medina was to you, is to you at the moment, and even why you decided to name this album Medina to the Universe. And maybe also why not have named an album that earlier on, since this is your fifth studio project? That's a good question. Uh, for me, Medina is home. Medina is where I was born and raised. Um, aside from the hospital, my mother gave me the, got the C-section and to bring me in, which was not Medina, but Medina is where I was raised up. That's where both sets of my grandparents lived as well. So it represents a lot to me, family. It represents where I learned life, you know, where I got to be streetwise and all of that. So those experiences and reflecting on it as part of my life's journey was important. So, so calling Medina to the universe was important, locating in the specific place of origin but it's to the universe so it's beyond Medina you, you reflect on where you came from and then you look into where you're going to so that's why it was important and I think it, it's also identifiable for a lot of other people because everybody has their origin story yeah. from where they come from and the older you go the more nostalgic you become about that or the more even if you're not nostalgic the more you realize how much it shaped you whether for good or for worse so for me it was important to put Medina on the map for this one on the fifth, but sometimes it takes that long to, you know, <laughs> to really do that reflection. So everything in good time. Mm -hmm. So 15 fire tracks in the album, a couple of collaborations from Ade Kunle, um, Teague Doubt, uh, um, Vic Mensa, um, who else? Ladipo is on the album. Uh, who else am I leaving out? Uh, Jules produced a track on the album. Um, man, I don't want to not mention anybody's name or forget, but I mean, all the dope producers and yeah. featured artists, everybody came through, for sure, yeah. yeah. So, so what I love about this album and about you um, is you're not afraid to, um, you know, to be different and to keep changing your style, keep changing your sound, but still sticking to the roots, which is hip-hop. So even in this album, you know, there's different genres that are getting in there. There's something for everybody, you know. So tell me about, um, you know, the concept of, uh, the musical concept and the inspirations of working on this album, the collaborations. How d did they all come about? How long did it take to produce um, this classic album? Are there still some uh, videos that are going to come off it? And what's next for the Medina to the Universe journey? This is part of it, you know, being here in Kenya, uh, you are in the UAE not so far ago, you're probably going to be going elsewhere, you know, spreading this amazing album. So let me know about the inspirations and where we're still going. Well, your questions are too good. Sometimes I'm listening to it and I'm mesmerized. I'm like, okay, uh, yeah. Um, I think the music and the, the diversity of it was the first part. Yeah, I, I do think you, you said it very well. It's I very early on made it a point to understand and to project the idea that it's okay to be different. Not just okay, it's actually great to be different. And so, nothing beats representing that in the music and the choice of music. 
where I slightly disagree with you is that as diverse as what I do is that I bring it together, it's not for everybody and that's fine. There's different people who can identify with different sounds, I agree, but it's not necessarily for everybody and that's fine. And that's why I want other artists such as myself to be okay with. Sometimes, you know, I might be fortunate to have people like you who enjoy it. Other person will be like, that's not my speed and that's cool. That's what comes with being... Who, who's not going to be enjoying Manifest? Come on, come on now, who? I mean, it's people who probably don't like plantain and beans. They've never eaten ugali in their life. You know. The jello for people. Yeah, the people, you know, they eat that other terrible jello. It's only people like that who don't like <laughs> So, yeah, so there's that. And um, with this album, it was actually born during the pandemic because I was working on a different project before that and I just did a quick pivot. And, and, and it, was, it was just an idea whose time has come. Yeah. And I was able to kind of zone in in the house. I had my engineer come to the house and then on my kitchen table, holding the mic like this, I was just going through songs, going through songs. I brought in some other songs that were already recorded and kind of finessed them to join it. But the majority of it was done during the pandemic. Okay, yeah, and then um, and this journey, you know, I think... This is the first album in a while in which I'm going to have the patience to, to let it live in many spaces over a period of time. And it's a very difficult thing for artists for us to do because we're always constantly recording new music and you know the idea of just sitting with something and allowing promoting and doing all these things and creating new fresh things is a difficult thing for us to do. But, but you feel like you want to give it the, the, the life it deserves and the length it deserves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And... And for me not to get bored with it, I have to be creative, creating new content. Definitely some new music videos, like you mentioned. I mean, people definitely want to hear, see music videos for Game Over, that they can learn clean and pure with Pato. Um, I might have one of those already. Who knows? Who knows? Um, so definitely more content, just being creative and taking it to the world, taking it to more stages. We have a couple of bookings in Europe, I believe, for the summer. So definitely looking to get more bookings in Africa and other places. And um, yeah, just just taking on the jet because I, it's, it's beyond the label of life, love. Is is yourself you put into the music, so I can't I can't treat it like a fleeting thing, like something that will come and go. So um, uh, let's see how my patience uh, plays out in this Madina to the Universe journey. <laughs> So my favorite songs in the album include, I think, La Vida for sure, Game Over for sure. Uh, Scorpio Flow, that's bad. Um, and which one else? Which one else? Which one else? Clean and Pure is my jam. Oh my God. And the reason why I like Clean and Pure also, I feel like it's, the message is very different, strong. Like you never ha hear anybody saying, my heart is <laughs> clean and pure. And no one whose heart is not clean and pure is going to say that for themselves. So. <laughs> well. Maybe you they say is hopefully they will decide to live up to the, the lie. <laughs> that will work for me too. That, that, that's also, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so really dope album. Like, um, and we were discussing this before off camera is like every artist always has like, I don't know, focus singles or favorite songs. But what do you feel about that? Like when you listen to this particular album or when you look at your discography and specific songs, how do you... Um, how do you approach them going forward? You know, when you go out to different countries, different cities, different stages, there's always different vibes for each kind of audience and fans. But you as an artist, how do you, how do you treat your music? First, I have, to, I have to go with what my heart believes. It's an important part of it too. What your art or heart? Believe. Clean and pure. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Because... Over the years, what I've realized is if you over-calculate something that you did not calculate in creating, you might be making an error. You know, because you'd be like, oh, no, this tempo is what radio plays, blah, blah. It could be an error you could be making. So, first of instinct. Then a little bit of strategy because it has to do with timing and, like you said, location. Um, and then some cohesion. That's the most difficult part of it. Uh, because at the end of the day, once you put it out, people take and use it for what it is. If I say, right now, I'm promoting Game Over Future and Dekule Gold, yeah. and they decide to play Clean and Pure, hey, what should I tell them? No, don't do that. You understand? You have to just allow it to have its own resonance. Because 
a creation is a thing that is its own living being. So you also cannot cage it or just put a, a muzzle on it or, 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 and, 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 or put the reins and always try to whatever. Sometimes you also have to listen to what it's doing. And so it's, it's part of it is navigating all these different things. Yeah. Be strategic is important. But also listening to what's happening is even more important. If I come to Kenya or as I've come to Kenya, I cannot pretend to know what the landscape is, you know. But I also cannot come here to blend in. I can say, this is who I am, this is what I'm presenting. But if you tell me that, oh, you know what? I've been playing the DJs' songs. This is what they are, whatever. I will listen to that and kind of figure it out and then think of time and etc. So it's a, it's, it's a delicate dance, but uh, it's, part of, it's part of the joys of doing, some, doing this work is that um, you are figuring it out as you go. It's never, it's, it's not, never a down moment, though. Never a down moment. Okay, so I, wanna, I wanted to ask you, when it comes to your style, your art, you know, the way you write, from the lyrics, to the bars, to the spitting, to the attitude, to the cockiness, if some people call it that, or to the bra bra bravado, or whatever, like, where does that come from? Like, were you just born like that, or how do you become so skillful that... You know, when you hear manifest, you know that's manifest. And um, because of how authentic you have been to yourself and to your, to your craft, like you've carved, you know, a huge niche for yourself and propagated a hip-hop, you know, Ghanaian hip-hop and uh, hip-hop all around. So how do you get all that? Well, I do acknowledge the natural gifts that they are. But I don't even, but I don't think, for instance, that I was born to do just one thing. But, so being able to harness the gifts has been something that spending a lot of time with myself and doing the work has been important. Uh, but then, then finally for me, just being a student of the thing, learning and creating and learning and evolving, I don't think I've arrived in any kind of form in terms of even the, 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 the peak of how I present myself, you know, constant evolution is, is important it's, while, while still staying true to center. So, me, I'm excited. I think that's one of the joys of it is just seeing how with different learnings over the years, one can grow. Because without growth, I might as well quit. The day that I feel like I've stopped growing in this thing, I'm quitting. I have to go somewhere else where I can grow. But, so, that's why I'm... Uh, Fortunately, still in it because the growth is always going to happen. So, d I'm going to ask an academic music uh, music question. An academic music question. That's a good one. <laughs> so, um, tell me about the influence um, that high life and hip life has had on hip hop and even Afrobeats to large extents. Because these are always conversations, especially happening in West Africa between Nigeria and Ghana. But even to to know how um, High life and hip life have influenced hip hop. I think it's an important conversation that we need to be having more often. Yeah. Well, high life, first and foremost, uh, for those who don't know, it is, it is the most, um, I guess, in, from the 20th century, or even earlier than the 20th century, it was the most significant popular music form in, in West Africa. And mainly Ghana, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, etc. Very guitar based. But what people, it's not traditional music, it's popular music of old, which, which like today's popular music fused um, traditional stuff with Western stuff, like jazz and other things. It's very guitar based, very melodic, etc. storytelling. And over the years, over a century and more, that has evolved. High Life was the, the music of my parents and our parents and our grandparents. So we came in and at some point, well, those before me, let me not pretend I was one of them. <laughs> At some point, we were also in love with something called hip-hop and, and found the importance to fuse it with high life and then with hip life or indigenized hip-hop, at least for the Ghanaian context and the West African context. Um, and over the years, what you've seen is that that then morphs into a lot of people who come from that hip-hop or hip, high, hip life or high life background now get into Afrobeats. You know what I mean? Because that would be the new way. But I draw an inspiration from that. You know, if you... One of the interesting things about 
hip hop is sort of is irreverent. It doesn't understand or, or honor rules when it comes to or it's not stiff. A lot of music genres that die out is because they're stiff. Hip hop would decide that auto tune and then it's auto tune. Hip hop would decide that this is the structure and that's what I think that's one of the things that probably takes from hip hop is sort of this irreverence about traditional structure or popular music structure bending different melodies etc and a lot of the people who come from the hip hop uh, hip life high life kind of culture in Africa are dominant in that scene and are bringing what they learned they didn't grow up listening to Afrobeat it didn't exist they created it <laughs> so um, it's a beautiful thing in that regard um, but you know it's I don't want to make it sound like it's this oh hip hop is this whatever but in our generation in our lifetime Hip hop has been that kind of force, which maybe for the generation before was jazz, and then that seeped into high life, etc. So, I, it's an interesting thing, and I think people should be doing documentaries and you yeah. know and other things about it. Because, you know, you know, I would, I would absolutely. I'm giving you free idea, but it's on record, so you know it's mine. I would absolutely explore the Afrobeat hip hop link, yeah. link in, a, in a in a piece yeah, and. Uh, interview all these Afrobeat artists and high life artists and and uh, what are the equivalents here on this side you know the ones who do the dance hallish whatever and just investigate that their relationship yeah, yeah, yeah. to it and so whether they were the yes worth looking into mm -hmm. yeah. okay, okay. So that was a long response but no, that shows well you it should be it should be a whole <laughs> film sorry yeah. well said well said so um, I wanted to ask you about just your staff, your brand, your business. Tell me about your festival, which happens annually but didn't happen last year because of COVID. Um, is it coming back again this year? It's very good here. Yeah, I can, I can smell food here. Yeah. <laughs> your food is coming. Yeah, so tell me about the festival. Yeah, my festivities. Um, something we... When I came, you know, I used to live in America at a point. So when I came back, one of the things, one of our ambitions as a team was to create a show at a festival in a space that would curate for very dope, different, but whatever music, like what I represented. And so we've been doing it for years. And a couple of years ago, we were able to scale it up to like, uh, up to like 4,000, 5,000. And uh, had great, uh, whatever. So it's something that, um, it's done during December as well, um, and uh, I'm excited about it because it also allows me to go beyond myself to help curate a musical experience for for the people like myself who enjoy that kind of thing. So you know, you never know. Maybe we might fly over a Kenyan artist or two to this year. So we'll see. That would be dope. Who who would you t take along? Who would I take along? So many dope people. Yo, Blinky, what's up? Are you coming? <laughs> By the way, speaking of Blinky, I feel like you two would um, would be really great like collaborators. I know you're really great friends, um, and you've been for a long time. But even the um, what do you call that? Like I don't know if there is the timbre of your voice. Like both of you have that like deep voice thing, and uh, I mean he's he's kind of rap singing sometimes, and you too. So I just really see you two. You know, doing some dope stuff. And at some point, <laughs> I went online and I was like, isn't there already a manifest Blinky song? So are you guys going to make it happen? Or how long do we have to wait? How long must we wait for Jesus to come? <laughs> the rapture. How long do we have to wait for, for, for African presidents to step down after being in office too long? These are all questions you never know. But we can say that Blinky and Manifest should come sooner than later. <laughs> All right. It's at that note that we end this wonderful interview. So Madina to the Universe is out and streaming worldwide. Please check it out um, wherever you are. You have to buy it. He was saying that you can actually, you know, steal it if you have to. But I'm saying you have to buy it. We have to support um, the hard work and the talent. Any other n message maybe you want to say to your fans, especially your Kenyan peeps? You know, or anybody watching beyond Kenya, or even the East Africans watching. I mean, we can give a special message to, to us, the people, the Swahili people, then the rest of the world, the rest of the universe. 
I love Kenya. I love Nairobi. I want to come back. I want to vacation in Lamu. I want to play shows. Hey, listen, I'm coming. And I want to do more with a lot of dope artists here. So thank you for everybody who supported. Thank you so much. You know, you, 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 you contributed immensely to my experience this trip, you know. So I love it. And, you know, that's why you're the baddest. <laughs> but yeah, nah, nah, nah. I'm, I'm always excited to reopen an old new chapter and yeah, then yeah. find a new book and keep moving. So more Nairobi diaries soon. And actually beyond Nairobi, you know, more, more Kenyan diaries. So. And another thing you said at one of the interviews we were at together, which I loved, I have to tell you because we didn't talk about it. But you say that you believe life is a never ending journey. And you never really arrive. I love that. Like nobody, I've never had anybody say that because there's always one achievement and another and then someone's like, I've arrived. It's like um, every artist wants to win a Grammy and they're like, uh, when I win a Grammy, I will have arrived. But from what you say, it seemed to me like there's always something to do and somewhere to go and room for growth. Absolutely. I think you sum it up perfectly. I think that's what it is. And now... Uh, Remembering that the joy is in the journey will give us more vim and clean and pure hearts to be able to go through that journey and, and not be cutthroat people and all these things. But just like, look, the process is important. And George, you haven't arrived. This is yet another step, yet another step, yet another step, you know, and, and why not, you know? And it, it, and it will show you sometimes the quality of human being you, you, you become when you see it that way. Because when you're always looking for a destination, you're always going to be shoving other people so that you can get there. But when you realize that it's, it's a journey, it's a process, you're going to have a different attitude. And even when you falter, you'll be able to come back to center and you just be a better quality human being. Yeah. Thank you so much, Manifest. It's been such an honor to talk to you, to work with you. Um, shout out to Fui for this wonderful opportunity. Shout out to manifest and all the Ghanaians people are really cool they're really nice people we're coming to your city um yeah and welcome back again to Nairobi thank you the motto words of a famous philosopher called Anu Schwarzenegger I'll be back <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>